by Rene Magritte. Don't ask me why, but he's my favorite. Ceci n'est pas une pipe. This is not a pipe. But this is a pipe. No, it's a picture of a pipe. Uh -huh. It's a picture of a pipe. Uh -huh. It's a picture of a pipe. Uh -huh. <laughs> Echelon. Echelon. Originally a secret government code name for a surveillance program. We are told the Echelon program was created in the late 1960s to monitor the military and diplomatic communications of the Soviet Union and its Eastern Bloc allies during the Cold War, and it was formally established in 1971. After the public disclosures and whistleblowing in the years 1972 to the year 2000. In 2001, Britain's Guardian newspaper summarised the capabilities of the Echelon system as follows. A global network of electronic spy stations that can eavesdrop on telephones, faxes and computers. It can even trace bank accounts, and this information is stored in Echelon computers which can keep millions of records on individuals. Officially, however, Nikki Hager Echelon is an investigative journalist exist. from New Zealand. In 1996, he published Secret Power, a wide-ranging inquiry into the New Zealand part of the Echelon network. He even managed to enter a listening station. When I have been secretly to the Waihopai station in New Zealand and looked through the windows there where the operations room is, I've seen the room where it gets broken down into phone calls here and faxes there and emails there, and it's run through these powerful computers which search for all the subjects they're interested in. And actually, there's no people there. The whole system can run itself. And actually, there's no people there. The whole system can run itself. We took Duncan Campbell to a location in Cornwall, in southwest England close to the Morwenstow station in order to experiment with echelon style interception techniques. This is baby echelon. With this very simple system, little battery, a scanner, we can listen to one communication at a time. All we do is we look up at the satellites. You can see how the 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 and aerial that we are using, its antennas pointed the same way at a nearby satellite to some of the ones which are behind me.
That is data. That was the end of a call. That's a fax. Maybe it's Arabic. We don't know. This is supposed to be a private phone call. We don't know where. She could be anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. She could be in Chile, she could be in Poland, or she could be in a ship in the ocean. And this system picks it up because there is no privacy. That is what the British and American and other intelligence services exploit. Signals that travel by satellite are completely not private. And whilst you can have fun as an amateur doing this, um, they invest billions of francs, hundreds of millions of British pounds in spying, exploiting the insecurity of the satellites. By the end of the 20th century, the system referred to as Echelon had evolved beyond its military and diplomatic origins to also become, quote, a global system for the interception of private and commercial communications, mass surveillance, and industrial espionage. Something is listening. What is a telescope? The dictionary description of a telescope is an optical instrument designed to make distant objects appear nearer. Telescopes contain an arrangement of lenses or of curved mirrors and lenses which rays of light are collected and focused and the resulting image magnified. As of the year 2018, this is the world's largest telescope. It is located in the Canary Islands of Spain and has an aperture or opening of which light can come through of 409 inches. This is not a pipe. This is a picture of a pipe. This is not a telescope. This is not even a picture of a telescope. This is a sound wave receiving device. There are clusters of these sound wave receiving devices in various out-of-the-way locations. Billions of dollars have been allocated to construct the new breed of these sound wave receiving devices. The new breed are called SKA or square kilometre arrays. Be assured these SKAs will be coming soon to a location near you. Do these devices transmit sound as well? Could the sound waves be directed? Trillions of dollars have already been spent on these devices. They take up acres of precious land. What for? Scanning the sky. Most people that I've asked think that these astronomical telescopes take pictures of deep space so we can learn about the universe. These devices are called radio telescopes and when they are clustered together they are called arrays. They receive sound waves. Those sound waves are converted to data that is turned by the magic of computer CGI into a pretty picture. Similar to how NASA and the other space agencies have been feeding us fake CGI images of the Earth, satellites and space for a very long time. The official multi-purpose of the VLA instrument is designed to allow investigations of many astronomical objects, including radio galaxies, quasars, pulsars, supernova remnants, gamma ray bursts, radio emitting stars, the sun and the planets, astrophysical mazes, black holes, and the hydrogen gas that constitutes a large portion of the Milky Way galaxy as well as external galaxies. Movies and documentaries have made famous the very large array in New Mexico. In the 2009 science fiction film Terminator Salvation, 
The VLA is the location of a Skynet facility, and at the beginning of the film, the site is attacked by resistance forces. Of course, Hollywood would have the Skynet facility blown up. A less drastic and less sensational solution would be to just cut the power and the backup power, or perhaps choose a route of Independence Day and upload a package. Sir, he's uploading the virus. Eagle One, the package is being delivered. The VLA was featured in Carl Sagan's 1980 documentary, Cosmos, A Personal Voyage. The VLA is present in the 1984 movie, 2010, The Year We Make Contact. The VLA is again present in the 1997 movie Contact as the location where the alien signal is first detected. I can't do that for you. You're going to have to um, meet somebody. I can't keep moving your back because we've got quite a lot on. The main differences between our experiment and Echelon are the number of communications intercepted, the fact that we cannot target certain conversations, and most importantly, the supercomputers which make up the network and which are capable of sifting through millions of intercepted communications. From the USA to Australia and the UK, these computers are all linked together. They are called dictionaries. One can enter, for example, the telephone number or bank account details of a person to be spied upon, and the computers go to work. They function much like an internet search engine, but instead of scanning websites, they scan our telecommunications. Mike Frost was a Canadian intelligence agent. He worked for 18 years at the CSE, the Canadian Electronic Surveillance Agency. As a former high-ranking officer, he is perfectly aware of the network's technical capabilities. If these private people were, were holding a conversation and used keywords that is in the, in the computer's dictionary, then that individual would become a target. Yes, yeah, so all you have to do is, is key the computer and you are now a target. Each partner nation produces a list of themes or keywords which can be changed or updated at will. And the computers go to work. They are able to analyze the contents of emails and file them away accordingly. It's known as semantic intelligence. But they can go one step further. They can use voice recognition. So if an individual has a, a distinctive voice, it is relatively simple today to feed a sample of that voice into the computer and tell the computer, I only want communications containing the word said by this individual. And the computer will do that regardless of, of what method of communications this individual is using, it being it his cell phone or his landline or, or whatever. This is not a pipe. In order to monitor and collect data in the 21st century with fiber optic telecommunications, Wi-Fi signals, mobile phone towers, as well as video transmissions, the data collection center would require power on a megalithic scale. This would require magnets on the same megalithic scale. Since its known inception some 60 years ago, where are we today? And is this why scientists have found computer code in the fabric of space? That's all I have to say on this subject now. Tag, you're it. ...want to happen, and we query nature for that, and that query goes through experiment. So although this has probably been very entertaining for my audience here, I think that at the end of the day, we have to keep grounded in it's got to be about things that affect your lives, and those things are measurable things. So, so where, where, where has this pursuit taken you?
Oh, my God. Where have you landed? Why would you ask that? I'm asking that here and now. It's New York City. It's okay. March 7. Well, partly it's taken to these very strange images that are behind your head right now. These are pictures of equations. I've been, for the last 15 years, trying to answer the kinds of questions that my colleagues here have been raising. And what I've come to understand is that there are these incredible pictures that contain all the information of a set of equations that are related to string theory. And it's even more bizarre than that because when you then try to understand these pictures, you find out that buried in them are computer codes just like the type that you find in a browser when you go surf the web. And so I'm left with the puzzle of trying to figure out whether I live in the matrix or not. <laughs> Right. You're blowing my mind at this moment. So you're saying, are you saying your attempt to understand the fundamental operations of nature leads you to a set of equations that are indistinguishable from the equations that drive search engines and browsers on yes, our computers? That is correct. So, the... wait, wait, I'm still, wait, I have to just be silent for a minute here. <laughs> so you're saying as you dig deeper, you find computer code writ in the fabric of the cosmos into the equations that we want to use to describe the cosmos yes computer code computer code strings of bits of ones and zeros it's not just sort of resembles computer code you're saying it is computer code it's not even just is computer code it's a special kind of computer code that was invented by a scientist named Claude Shannon in the 1940s. That's what we find very, very deeply inside the equations that occur in string theory and in general in systems that we can say are supersymmetric.